director of the Center for Urban and Community Research at Goldsmiths College um, at the University of London. And he's a former colleague of mine from Goldsmiths, and we actually studied the same supervisor at Oxford, so it's really nice that uh, Michael's here today. His research interest focuses on issues of representation in the city in relation to urban policy, race and racism, and issues of policing. His publications include a book called Race, Riots, and Policing, Law and Disorder in a Multi-Racist Society, which was published by UCL. And he edited a collection of essays called Place and the Politics of Identity from Rutledge, Racism, the City and the State, also from Rutledge, and Hallow Promises, Rhetoric and the Reality of the Inner City by Castles in 1990. He edited with Stephen Pyle, Geographies of Resistance from Rutledge in 1997, which was an important book in social and cultural geography. Um, he's also, among many other things, the co-director of the Deptford City Challenge Project in the southern, southeastern part of London. He's doing major research projects and uh, development projects in China. Um, he was also, as you'll see in the presentation I'm sure today, the head of Tower Hamlets, the labor head of Tower Hamlets, which is, which is in the eastern part of London. So Michael will speak today. The title of his talk is Geopolitics on the Street, Transnationalism, the Political Imagery, and the Personal Account of, the Conte of Contemporary London Elections. Thank you, Charles, and um, thank you for the invitation. Uh, just to introduce the, the, the talk itself, Charles asked me today to talk a little bit about um, what's been happening in London from a biographical perspective, which is why this isn't a, a straightforward uh, academic paper. It's uh, a paper that is, if you like, a collision between one part of my life, which is my uh, political career, and another part of my life, which is an academic career. And if you like, the academic interests are, are, are the shadow throughout the, the story that uh, I'm going to tell over about uh, 40 minutes. Um, to give you uh, a little bit of background uh, to the uh, political context um, which I'm talking about is that uh, uh, in London, uh, one part of London immediately to the east, London has 32, 32 boroughs. Each borough is responsible for, for schooling, for planning, for development, for uh, health has a degree of control over policing. It represents roughly about a billion pound a year organization. Uh, that's about two billion dollars a year. And of those 32 boroughs, the borough I was responsible for uh, five years and was a representative of for 12 years in various other uh, roles, um, was is the London Borough of Tower Hamlets. Immediately to the east of the City of London, it runs from uh, Whitechapel, uh, Brick Lane, uh, the, uh, the old Jewish ghetto of London, through across to the River Lee, uh, where interestingly the first version of segregation in London, people don't talk about very often, the first model of apartheid was when uh, King Alfred re recaptured the city from the Danes, and the Danes were banished to the east of the River Lee. So on one side you had the Danes, and the other side you had uh, uh, the, the Angles, as it was. Uh, but it contains both uh, the, the New Docklands, the financial district uh, on the Isle of Dogs, which has um, now is the second largest financial district in Europe in its own terms, uh, has about uh, 100,000, getting on for 150,000 jobs in the financial services. Uh, it also it contains some of the most um, uh, the most broke parts of the United Kingdom, some of the most intense concentrations of, of poverty. Uh, it's remarkable both for its forms and history of exclusion, but also for the moments uh, at which those forms of exclusion have been challenged. Uh, historically, the East End is where Oswald Mosley from the British Union fascists chose to march in the 1930s. It's also where communities of difference came together, Irish, Jewish, Caribbean, uh, among others, among many others actually, to oppose Mosley. And Mosley's march through Cable Street was famously uh, turned away. Uh, with this, under the slogan, they shall not pass. It's the place where in the 1980s, uh, the first uh, far-right uh, fascist um, councillor from the British National Party uh, was elected in uh, 1993, the first successful representation of that in democratic electoral politics of the British National Party. But it's also where, again, a coalition of Bangladeshi, white, 
Jewish, Christian, Islamic groups came together to uh, reject the presence of the British National Party. So it is a site historically of both moments of great um, despair and moments of transcendence of, of that despair. And I guess part of the context I wanted to talk about today is one where, if you like, to, to give away the strap line and then hopefully justify it a little bit, it's one where I think it is important to understand uh, the genesis, the genealogy, the cartography, the maps, the roots of, of forms of intolerance that uh, cross a variety of uh, religious faiths that include anti-Semitism, that include forms of Islamophobia, that include forms of, of faith hate that cross just about each religion, uh, and to understand where they're, they're coming from, but also to understand those political imaginaries in the context of other geopolitics. And so part of the point I'm trying, I'm trying to make, I guess, is that uh, we need a quite careful scrutiny of the genesis of forms of intolerance in order to uh, neither uh, oversimplify their production nor, if you like, reproduce sometimes their, their, their binary and simplistic Manichaean, Schmittian thinking in particular ways. However, I wanted to start um, the talk. There's a reality show on... Um, which covers most uh, endemol production, sell it to most countries in the world. I don't think they've yet sold it to the USA, so I assume many people will not have heard of it. It's a program called Big Brother. Uh, Big Brother is a reality TV show where people are uh, confined uh, to a house uh, for a period of a few weeks or a month or two months in some cases, and then all of their movements are, are scrutinized. It's a fairly horrific uh, form of entertainment. Uh, it started in the Netherlands, it crosses, um, there are versions of this in, in Australia, in Brazil, in most, co most countries in the world. One version of it in the United Kingdom is a, a version of Celebrity Big Brother. George Galloway, a politician, criticized it as an How many people here have heard of George Galloway? And I'll explain um, uh, Mr. Galloway in a little bit more detail. Um, Galloway is um, somebody who was a politician on the Labour uh, left, who uh, at some times was on the Labour right, uh, came out of the Scottish context, which was marked by a particular politics in the Scottish uh, Labour Party around tensions between Catholic and Protestant, interestingly, but also uh, was in, uh, involved in the early stages of an NGO called um, uh, War on Want that he, he ran and was involved in a controversy uh, around War on Want and its the finances of it before he became a controversial MP. He left the, the Labour Party, was expelled from the Labour Party uh, due to his position on uh, his response to the uh, Iraq. Uh, Iraq war, principally but also after a history of disputes with the party. Um, he has been uh, identified uh, and alleged to have been a recipient of um, uh, benefits from the, the, oil, the, oil, the sanctions oil money. Um, again, that's hotly contested and subject to legal dispute. But in the United Kingdom, he's most famous because he became an MP. <coughs> in the East End of London in the 2005 uh, government elections uh, when he ousted uh, Una King, one of only two uh, black British members of parliament in the Bethnal Green and Bowe constituency in town, that's in, in London, uh, which was one of the safest uh, seats for the Labour Party. And Galloway fought that seat as a member of a new party respect uh, which I'm going to be talking a little bit uh, about during the, the course of this, this uh, discussion. Um, Galloway uh, in order, is an extraordinary character that I could talk about at length, although carefully, since I'm currently being sued by him, um, as a number of other people actually. But um, he, is, he is somebody who has um, a particular profile, uh, but he is not, he is you like background to, but not absolutely central to, to the story that I, I want to, uh, to discuss. The, the reason for the leaflet was because on May the 4th, last year, May the 4th, 2006, on the night before a set of local elections, 
um, I found myself uh, the subject of some dispute about this particular leaflet. Mr. Galloway, this character here, had um, joining Big Brother House in the celebrity version uh, became uh, kind of famous uh, in the end. What happens in the, this particular reality TV program is that the, the intensity of publicity tends to build up as the participants in the in the program don't realise that they're being subjected to a set of almost Pavlovian or Skinnerian tests of the way that they, they might behave. So recently, again, people in the room may not have been aware of this, but there was another the version this year, the 2007 version of the Celebrity Big Brother show, involved a Bollywood star, Shilpa Shitty, uh, who was subjected to racist abuse of a fairly poisonous kind by some of the other participants in the show that was then beamed uh, across Britain, but then became a matter of global significance as uh, her abuse became uh, significant in India. Gordon Brown, the probable next prime minister, probable successor to Tony Blair, was in visiting India at the time, had to apologize to the Indian nation as, as the presence on this reality show of a Bollywood star and her abuse became quite literally a matter of international tension, uh, international tension between the United Kingdom and, and, and India. So, so that the actual the translation of a scandal at national level into a global a matter of global significance came through uh, the television set. In, in Galloway's case, uh, he was uh, famously uh, behaved in a way where he uh, was seen to be uh, licking, performing as a cat uh, and in, the, in the reality show and sipping milk from the, the, the hands of a, 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 a woman, but also in this case dressing up in a leotard and dancing with somebody who is famously a transvestite. Mm -hmm. the, reason that, the reason that I start with the, the leaflet though is because on May the 4th, uh, to my surprise, um, at about midnight on the day before the elections, uh, some of the people uh, were trying to distribute this leaflet, which was obviously a not, by American standards, a relatively mild leaflet, I guess, but drew attention to Mr. Galloway's um, history, but also in the context of three candidates from his party below. And as a result of distributing that leaflet, uh, I found myself trying to negotiate with some representatives of um, Islamic Forum Europe, uh, who are a partic one particular body that I'll come back to on the, the, the discussion, but who were suggesting that um, this representation was itself a form of profanity. And the surreal nature of the conversation was that they were holding at uh, or some friends of theirs, again, I choose my words carefully, held at knife point the people who were distributing the leaflet and we had a slightly surreal uh, debate at about 12 o'clock, 12.30 12, uh, in the back streets of the East End of London about whether it was possible or not to distribute this leaflet with the suggestion being that it would be all right if the leaflet was distributed with the figures in the bottom half cut off um, and the top half being distributed but not uh, with the implication that, that the profanity of the cross-dressing spread to the people below. And I suppose what I want to try and do is try and make sense of exactly what was going on in that slightly bizarre, slightly surreal, um, frankly, slightly frightening, uh, slightly frightening moment. Uh, in, in the context of these five moments of, of, of collision, in order to try and explain to you, I guess, the ways in which forms of Islamism and forms of Islamophobia sit uh, alongside uh, old histories of multiculturalism and a Jewish presence in East London and new forms of anti-Semitism in ways in which um, I think the nature of the multicultural settlement of the city and the ways in which multiculturalism is realized in London is changing very rapidly. Uh, and if we're, to, if we're to understand this change, I think we need to understand the ways in which uh, forms of imaginary community spread themselves globally in a way in the 21st century that is new. We have to understand the processes by which these forms of global sentiment actually are generated, but sit alongside forms of national rational organization that 
political um, parties. But also, we need to then understand both the pitfalls they represent, but also not exaggerate their ideological power or underestimate the fact that they are contested on the ground. And I want to try and say this by, by running through a little bit of the background to, to where how that leaflet came to be possible. How it came to be possible that people would be held at knife point for distributing that leaflet at this time, at this time last year. And the starting point, if anyone wants to, uh, copies of the, the PowerPoint, I'm just going to run through a little bit about how uh, the city, multiculturalism appears in the, in the city, and in particular in it, how it appears in London. But think about uh, the ways in which there is a tension between what I would describe as the liberal and the communitarian notions of political organisation, of ethical organisation of the city before coming back to the ways in which a new politics is emerging in Britain, which I don't think is particularly unique to Britain, which is simultaneously both highly local in its realizations, whilst being strikingly global in its, in its political imaginings. In other words, if we, can, only if we can understand the interplay between the global and the local, some, some people describe as the, global, the globalization of politics, can we begin to understand how new forms of intolerance emerge, as well as new uh, political um, campaigns that try and address that intolerance. And in part, I'm afraid I'm only going to be able to signal some of my interests um, academically. But what um, the book, um, After the Cosmopolitan, um, that Charles kindly mentioned at the beginning of the talk, tries to discuss is, is the ways in, in which tensions between theories of liberal subjects, theories of liberal politics, and theories of community politics, theories of communitarian politics, actually create certain kinds of tension in the ways in which we think about multiculturalism today, the way we think about uh, the, the new forms of diversity in the city today. And that if we're to make sense of those new forms of multiculturalism, we have to understand both the way in which the past haunts the present but also forms of future vision equally inflect the present. And likewise, how actually we need to understand that the city itself is, is thought of almost as a map in a way which either naturalizes difference, the mosaic, the notion that the city exists as a mosaic of different ethnic pieces, or alternatively, the city might be, if not a melting pot, this, the sites in which forms of cultures come together and create new forms of the hybrid, the novel, the, the sorts of invention that are at the heart of a different kind, kind of dynamism. And so these tensions that, that come out of the, like the spatialization of the city as well as the histories of the city actually might make us, again, think slightly differently about where intolerance comes from and where it might be going to in a full realization of the two quotes that I won't uh, go through both of them, but the one in particular, that Amos Oz's point that there is a tension between peace and justice. Peace requires compromises where justice detests them. And I suppose what I'm trying to do is begin to get to a point where we think a little bit more carefully about what is going on in forms of uh, rhetorics of nationalism I'm highly suspicious of, rhetorics of Islamophobia, which are undoubtedly uh, growing in the context of contemporary United Kingdom, but also the forms of anti-Semitism that have emerged uh, more, more, more recently on the ground. And in part, part of doing this, and again this may be uh, of, of, may or may not be of uh, interest to people here, I hope it's of some, but one of the things that interests me is, is returning Benedict Anderson's famous book, uh, Imagine Communities has been reissued uh, quite recently, last uh, tail end of last year, with a, uh, a new afterword by Benedict Anderson. But it's one of the, for those people who don't know the work, it's one of the defining uh, pieces of work that looks at the history of the history of nationalism. And it is part of that work, what uh, Benedict Anderson tries to do, is to understand where sentiments of, of nationalism come from, how they become particularly strong in the late 19th century. 
and dominate the 20th century, and they're almost naturalized in the 20th century as a normal way of organizing society. The nation rests, as we know, on invented traditions. When you begin to look at it a little bit more carefully, there is you know, work by people like Eric Hobsbawm and Terry, uh, Terence Ranger that looked at the ways in which most flags, most national anthems, most stamps all kind of emerge as symbols of nationhood, uh, particularly in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, but are themselves you know, not natural phenomena that have existed there forever, but are actually products of particular historical, uh, historical moments. And Anderson's logic in um, his, his work, importantly, I think, was, and this is a quote from the original, uh, that a sense that at the heart of uh, the imagining of the, the nation was a corollary dissipation of <coughs> religious affiliation. And that that sense of, if you like, transition permanence through time, which Benedict Anderson in his work identified very much with print and the rise of, of popular um, <coughs> literacy, gave a sense of the nation giving purpose of humanity perpetuating itself through time in a way which displaced and followed on from Anderson's inviting in like, the late 70s, early 80s, uh, suspected disappearance of uh, religious, religious faith. As the quote says, with the ebbing of religious belief, the suffering in which belief in part composed did not disappear. Disintegration of paradise. Nothing makes fatality more arbitrary. Absurdity of salvation. Nothing makes another style of continuity more necessary. What then was required was a secular transformation of fatality into continuity, contingency into meaning. It's actually a very beautifully written book. I think it's wrong in lots of ways and for an interesting discussion about Benedict Anderson's book. But the notion was that the imaginary that was at the heart of the nation was in part about the displacing of, of religious but Belief. And it seems T.J. Clark, the largely art historian, has written in kind of revisiting um, the notion of political imaginaries in 2007 and thinking about Anderson's work 24 years on, has actually tried to make the point that uh, what has happened is not that seemingly straightforward enlightenment succession of the national imaginary and the disappearance of a religious imaginary. But in fact, as it says in the quote, a rejigging of the balance of the forces between nation and Umar, nation and congregation, nation and jihad, nation and the chosen people. And although this is most commonly identified with Islam, it cannot be reduced to Islam, but we, have, we need to think about the emergence of new forms of transnational political imaginary and how they are realized in particular local, local settings. He also tries to develop the notion that, that what he described, whereas Benedict Anderson has identified print capitalism with the national imaginary, popular literacy with the sense of a national imaginary, that there was a sense of screen capitalism uh, that, that actually translates a new technology of the global, and that this is part of the sense of a new kind of dis diaspora or sensibility. Can you turn out satellite TV? So yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely, and it is in, in a context where I'm, I'm going to jump through some of this because otherwise I'll, I'll run out, run out of time. But I think this is in, in a context where I guess we are we are bombarded by new forms of representation of the global, the global present. But also those new forms are mediated in particular sorts of ways. So in the United Kingdom. Um, uh, and I uh, guess in many, many other contexts, there is a, a shift from broadcasting to narrowcasting in many ways. One of the ways in which the political elections of 2005 were contested in East London were through very different media. So, very explicitly, as, as a leader of the council, I would appear in front of the white English press which covered uh, an audience speaking in English, but I would also have press conferences with the Bangladeshi press and on Bangladeshi TV stations. There are two TV stations which are Bangladeshi and broadcast exclusively to a Bangladeshi subscription audience. The demography of the East End, the area where I was talking about Tehran, this is a population of about 200,000 people. Uh, about 51% um, <coughs> uh, of that population is of non-white background, and that 51% is largely uh, Bangladeshi, uh, though not entirely. There's a very old um, African-Caribbean community that dates back from the old docks, uh, as well as an old Somali community 
dates back 100 years. It's also that part of London covers the original Chinatown, the first Chinatown in the globe, the, the opium dens you'll find in a lot of Victorian novels and Dickensian descriptions of, of London and, and Limehouse in particular. But in today's East End, it is one where whiteness, the whiteness of the 47, 48, 49% of the, the non-visible minority population is itself um, embossed with particular historical trajectories. Uh, and in particular, the historical trajectories of what are sometimes described as uh, <coughs> Catholic whopping and, and Jewish stepping. The area around the docks, uh, the docks themselves were, were, were built largely by Irish migrants in the late 19th century. And it is still the case that parts of the, those old Dockland areas on the Feast of the Virgin Mary on August 15th, uh, the, there is a beating of the bounds of, uh, of Catholic whopping, even though that area is so gentrified that you now have flats that are owned by, by Cher, by Rod Stewart, by famous soccer players, and even Helen Mirren is up for an Oscar in a few weeks, uh, bought an old council house for a million pounds just a couple of years ago, two million dollars. Um, to the north of the, the highway, you have the, the residuum of the old Jewish community, uh, but again, one diminishing fairly rapidly in terms of age, in terms of people moving out of the area. But in terms of a visible environment, still a number of synagogues present, still a, a very kind of clear historical trace of what used to be, as I say, the old, the old ghetto. And I think what, what I'm trying to suggest is if we're thinking about the complexities of those old historical landscapes sit alongside this new mediated globalization of different kinds of, of global, global struggle. And the, I won't go into detail about the, the, the over, the over it, but there is, a, there is a sense in which the, the kind of over um, saturation of, of images, of stories, of press, of TV, of internet, uh, create a different kind of problem that actually echoes a very old problem from the late 19th, early 20th century, which is how do you edit down that excess of images and information into something that makes sense? And George Zimmel, when he was writing about the city in the late 19th century, used to describe that process of editing down as at the heart of a certain form of rationalization, of rationality so, and, and in a sense, what um, I want to try and suggest is that the notion of the city that sits is an old map of, of London, uh, a famous map that, uh, from Nicholas Abercrombie in the 1940s, that you kind of define little blobs of communities and, and as the, the city uh, as existing as these sets of tight little geographical communities exist, existing one alongside another implies a particularly strongly communitarian vision of the city itself but is one that has a value of one note. it's not one I want to just kind of discredit or, or discard but this particular kind of version of the communitarian the known parts of the city that are made up by their, their small pieces actually valorizes some things. It values some things and discredits other things. It values a particular sense of, of the local, the known, and the, the things that we hold dear to us. But it also actually tends to value the past. And there is a different kind of scholarship, a different kind of politics that has tended to suggest that, that that kind of, of valuing of the past might be problematic. Hannah Arendt, the famous scholar around the public sphere and public debate, that actually talked about um, the importance of the present and the, the journey human beings need to take to become adults, to be free of memory's chains, to live now. So the point that I'm trying to make is that within traditions that, of, of political thought, there are very different takes on the extent to which we value the local or value the historical. Precisely because some, for some people, valuing the local and valuing the historical is about recognizing where you have come from. But for others, that, there is a way in which that obstructs the way to create new political presence and possible political futures. And what I'm trying to suggest is that in a very, very multicultural dynamic part of the world, such as in East London, that actually inflects relationship between 
communities of migrant settlement and their histories and their geographies globally in slightly different ways in 2007 than it did when we were writing about thinking about cities in the, in the 20th, 20th century. I'm going to skip this actually because what, what I want to try um, to do is just give you a little bit of a sense of what happened in East London in 2005. Ulrich King was the um, is a friend, a Labour, a Labour member of Parliament whose um, uh, mother is is Jewish, but she's uh, her uncle is Tom Stoppard, the playwright. For some of you may know. Um, her dad is Preston King, who's an African American political scientist. Um, who, and she was one of the first two British black MPs in the House of Commons in, in Westminster. And she sat in the House of Commons for two terms from uh, 1997 to 2000 and 2005. Um, she was kind of, without going into a huge amount of detail, she was uh, well known as somebody who was. Uh, intelligent, sharp, photogenic, uh, predicted to go very far politically. Uh, she tended to blot her political copybook by actually opposing uh, the government around certain immigration legislation in its first term, 1997 to 2001. But as one of only two British black um, uh, MPs, she had a particularly high profile, a particular high profile media presence. And controversially, and I have to say, I personally Disagree, disagree quite strongly. She supported um, the invasion of Iraq publicly uh, on grounds that uh, were consistent with positions she had taken historically. And said uh, much of what I say, I assume on several things. I assume that I will say would, I would disagree with some people in this room and agree with, with others maybe. But I personally was strongly opposed to the invasion of, of Iraq. But Una came out publicly in favour of the, the Iraqi invasion and therefore became a subject of a particularly intense um, political debate uh, at a local level. Her constituency was uh, majority Bangladeshi, and her support for the invasion of Iraq became a matter of major uh, political substance. Um, and in particular, she was subjected to a growing amount of abuse about it. That was what led up to uh, Mr. Galloway actually standing and creating a new political uh, party initially in East London known as Respect, which drew together broadly the Socialist Workers' Party uh, that stands to the left of the Labour Party, along with a number of groups that were broadly uh, associated with um, a particular strand of Islamic politics in uh, contemporary London. And it's, it's an important uh, marriage of different forces. And what, what had happened in the end was that in, in the 2005 campaign, uh, the national campaign, there was one of the most vicious political campaigns that had been seen in the United Kingdom over the last 15, 20 years. A lot of very strong personages, having been involved in politics in that part of London for over 20 years, I, I've never actually seen anything um, as poisonous since the late 1980s when the British National Party, the, the fascist party, were at last strongly active. Um, Una's identity, which was always important, and I think this is an important distinction to make, it had always been important to the fact that she was in a largely Bangladeshi part of London, that she was not Bangladeshi. So there had always been a strand of race politics about her identity, about the non-Bangladeshiness of her, her politics. But in a ways that were quite disturbing to see at the time. Um, when, when, when she was elected, was it initially, was it with a large majority? It was with a large majority, although with a reduced majority on the predecessor, because there had been a debate about whether there should be a Bangladeshi MP in 1997. Um, so it was an issue that she was uh, a, black, a black British woman who had been elected in uh, that Bangladeshi area. But what, what became commonplace in the campaign in 2005 was a number of attacks on her personally as being both black and Jewish. And there was uh, a series of kind of recorded incidents, and she's written about this herself, so I don't want to go into any great detail, but 
having been present on a number of occasions, there, there was a sense in which, you know, she would, that, to use the language, that, that, that she was told to fuck off black Jewish bitch, and a lot of very, very, a lot of very, very nasty uh, and quite um, increasingly kind of populist uh, attacks on her identity, which hadn't been part of uh, the various kind of ups and downs of local politics to the extent that um, I, you know, had been common. Uh, and what, what I just want to do is the, the, the second of the, the five moments of, if you like, politics in the East End that I want to dwell on for a second, is through a particular park. I don't know how many people actually know the, the, face by, the, the song by the Small Faces, who were kind of pop group in the late 1960s, early 1970s, called uh, Ichigo Park. Uh, Ichigo Park actually is, it was a song that was named after the Itchy Parks of Inner East London. Uh, itchy, itchy because they were full of um, tramps with fleas. Um, so, so Ichiku Park actually was was a song uh, that was written uh, about this particular park and a couple of other parks, which is known now as Alta Valley Park. And the reason I want to kind of go through this is there's a lot of kind of in interesting, weird background about this particular place. It's alleged by some of the kind of psychogeographers of London that in this drinking fountain, if you look through the hole, this is an old 12th century uh, construction that you can see down one of the old ley lines of, of, of London. Uh, but uh, there's also actually the, the, the park where the, the person who executed Charles I is buried, is buried in the park. It was an old church that's uh, bombed out. And it's, it's, uh, um, it's also the site of kind of political gathering in one very small park of East London. Just near here, just near that gate that you see up there, in 1978, in one of the most horrific racist attacks in uh, East London, uh, an old, um, uh, 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 a Jewish garment worker, rag trade, sorry, a Bangladeshi rag trade worker, was walking home and was attacked, beaten, and killed in one of the most vicious racist killings of the late 1970s. His name was Alta Valley. And the council renamed the park after him to commemorate his, his death and his murder. So from 1979, the park's been known as Alta Valley Park. Interestingly, every single year from 1979 through to 2007, the park's name, Alta Valley Park, was painted over by people who resent the renaming of the park uh, after uh, Abagadeshi and Garmaka. And each time, every year, the name is put back on again several times. The name, this actually has been it has diminished in the, the last year or so, but not by much, it's still regularly. So there's a kind of strand of popular racist sentiment that chooses to try and erase the renaming of the park, only for the park to be renamed, renamed each time, even now, 27, 28, almost 30 years on from out about his death. So that, that kind of erasure and recreation of the park is something that is important. It's also the site where if you look at the, um, maybe better, at the corner of the park, the Bangladeshi community created a memorial, a Shahid Mina. The Shahid Mina you can find in Dhaka, you can find in Oldham, you can find in various spaces of the Bangladeshi diasporic community across the world. It's also, what it is, is it's an interestingly kind of modernist structure that commemorates the, the language markers of 1952. If you think about Bangladesh as a nation, it emerges as a nation from, first of all, the, the decolonization of the Raj in 1948 and the partition of India, the creation of Pakistan East and West as opposed to, to India, but also out of a set of tensions between West Pakistan and East Pakistan, one of which was the attempted imposition on East Pakistan of Urdu as the lingua franca of the, of the nation, and the emergence of language struggles as being classically, in that Anderson form, a form of national imaginary. The, the right to speak Bengali became a subject of controversy. And in 1952, a number of people who were language marks were killed in their attempt to push that campaign forward and that language campaign was seen as one of the grounding moments of 
the development of a national struggle that culminated in 1971 when Sheikh Mujib Rahman led the Awami League to political success in East and West Pakistan, but Mujib was toppled and his legitimacy was challenged. And the Bangladeshi national struggle against West Pakistan, as was, became a struggle between the West Pakistan army and East Pakistan uh, resistance, nationalist resistance, but importantly at that time, East Pakistan national resistance was um, also opposed by Jamaat Islam, Jamaat who owe the, the political genealogy partly through um, <coughs> Muslim Brotherhood, but also the, the route back to the Gulf. But also the, the most important point that I want to make in the kind of limited time that, that we've got is, is that the struggle for Bangladeshi nationalism is a struggle that is partly against West Pakistan, but it's also partly against Jamaat itself. Against Jamaat itself, and at the time in 1971, and there's a lot of documented evidence about this. A large number of people were actually um, killed uh, by uh, Jamaat. Something that is still uh, commemorated today, because of course what happened was in 71, um, the Indian Army intervened supporting the struggle for Bangladeshi nationalism. And of course, both uh, <coughs> the West Pakistan army were defeated in Bangladesh, but also the, uh, Jamaat as a political party. And those people have been involved in, in the, the killings. Some people talk about the genocide of 71, were themselves forced out of the country. Many of the people, or some of the people, uh, at any rate, involved in uh, the events of 71 fled, as people do, from Lenin, Trotsky, Marx, many others over the years, fled to, fled to London. And of course, the Bangladeshi community, from 71 to the present day, has been partly a site of debate about the various strands of Bangladeshi nationalism on the one hand, and exiled Jamaati politics on the other, with very much the case that in the first generation of politics there was relatively little presence in the main political debate. In the second generation of politics in the 1980s and 90s, the dominant strand of Bangladeshi politics in Britain is secular and is leftist. So that whereas the Salman Rushdie's satanic verses becomes of enormous controversy globally in the 1980s and in various parts of Britain, Satanic Verses doesn't play as an issue in the East End of London uh, in anything like the same way because the dominant politics of Bangladeshi uh, diaspora community at that time is secular, is leftist, is not uh, in favor of uh, a rejection of, of, of Rushdie's work straightforward. But what has occurred over the, over the recent time, particularly since the invasion of Iraq, but also more broadly, Yes, is a, a, a third or fourth generation politics that is much more global in its vision, much more explicitly Islamic in its mobilization, and much more explicitly tied to organizations like Jamaat, Jamaat, uh, Jamaat Islam. But the point I want to make is that this is highly contested. So that the, the organization Public Informer tie into an organization called Nirmal Committee, who challenged that the Saidi is a uh, former Jamaati member of parliament in, in Bangladesh more recently who is a preacher who visits London. But his presence in London is being challenged. And in the same part, this is a, a protest against Saidi being allowed into the, the United Kingdom. So there is a debate, the point I'm trying to make is that there is, a, there is an ongoing debate, a contest about how the notion of Bangladeshi identity, of Islamic identity is thought about, which reflects the histories of elsewhere, Bangladesh itself, as well as the histories of East, East London. And the point that I, I want to make, I guess, is that um, what happens in recent years is that respect emerges as a new political party that draws upon a sense of global Islam that is partly about a rejection of second, third generation Bangladeshi politics within the mainstream, but is also drawing upon a particular kind of version of the known, the known local unit, a particular kind of communitarian politics. And I want to explain what I mean, mean by that. 
but very straightforwardly, again, for those of you that are interested in it, I think the fact that there is a tension between the conventional politics of uh, liberalism, I don't mean it in the kind of the, the pejorative context in which it's used journalistically in both the US and the UK sometimes, but a politics that emphasizes human rights, that emphasizes the, the importance of the individual that emphasizes the importance of the ability to, to, to debate the political settlement in the here and now is one that can be inflicted by and there is a liberalism of the left and there is a liberalism of the right. And I think it's one, something that we sometimes forget that there is both you know, the liberalism of the left and the liberalism of, of the right. But it sits in an uneasy tension with communitarianisms of the left and communitarianisms of, of the right. And, and I think what, what emerges in the ways in which contemporary uh, faith-based politics emerges is that it tends to be based on an appeal to community, an appeal to community that is very often transnational in the sense that I was trying to illustrate, but is also highly local. And I'll just give you one example of this, this particular thing. So those of you who, who will know the background of the politics of, of Texas in the period when, when your current president was uh, gov governor, um, they would be aware of the development of faith-based politics that appeals to the traditions of the IEF, the Industrial Areas Foundation, the kind of politics very much inspired by Saul Alinsky, as you know, his writer, the American uh, writer, which tended to try to draw together community politics in ways which made appeals to, if you like, the known local, local subject. That kind of IAF type mobilization also works at a, trans, a transnational level. So that when you see in, in Texas in, in uh, the late 80s and 90s, you know, from which is exact control, uh, controlling the dates, but people in the room will, will know, know better than I, you see there's a book by Mark Warren actually called Dry Bones Rattling where he describes the sorts of communitarian politics that emerge in, in, in Texas. Uh, he characterizes it in largely positive ways, but the importance is that you have a link between faith-based communities confronting the state in, in particular ways. That kind of politics has actually been um, translated internationally so that those faith-based alliances actually do work together on training programs where the known what I think you might almost call the global familiar, the neighborhood, the family, certain kinds of, <coughs> of moral issues become foregrounded across faiths, and they become quite a powerful way of mobilizing uh, social groups. It means that in London, there is a direct connection that is between forms of IAF mobilization around Islam with forms of Christian mobilization in the South, in Texas. People have training links that actually match them up on, on that cross international national basis. Uh, it's also importantly, that I think, that, that we understand that parts of these routes, these cultural traffic, there is a debate about the ways in which contemporary Islamism, and I think that that itself demands many hours, so I want to be very, very careful what I say, but kind of recognize how much I don't have the time to say around that subject. The debate about Islamic radicalization in London. Um, is partly about the cultural traffic that links various forms of Salafi uh, <coughs> based practice and ideas in, from Saudi and the Gulf through London to Bangladesh. So a kind of cultural traffic that links up Saudi Arabia, East London and Bangladesh today through a kind of political transnational imaginary. But also it overlaps, and some of the personnel are exactly the same, with a different kind of cultural traffic about political mobilization about the neighborhood and cross-faith mobilization that links uh, southern churches in the USA to East London in a different form. So these kinds of cultural traffic that are transnational involve exactly the, 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 the same people. They also involve a particular kind of <coughs> contest about the multicultural settlement of London. The parts of East London that I'm, I'm, I'm talking about is one where we have seen, in the time in which I've been a politician representing that part of London, 12 years, uh, we've been bombed seven times. 
Um, seven times in, in 12 years in just that small part of, of East London. That in, includes, um, and I'll, I'll, get, I'll get the counting wrong, in four big IRA bombs. Um, so the, the IRA ceasefire was broken when uh, Canary Wharf, the Docklands, was, was bombed. There were two big city bombs uh, just down the road from where I live, actually, on the, uh, which right on the edge of, of the borough. And a fourth major bomb that didn't go off um, as well uh, in the kind of period of time that was roughly, I guess, 1990 to 1994-ish, that's that sort of period. There was also people in 1990, uh, 1999, David Copeland, this man uh, identified with the far right, chose to blow up you know, the iconographic sites of British, uh, British multiculturalism. He put a bomb in Brixton, the heart of the Caribbean community in London. He came to uh, Brick Lane in East London, put a nail bomb in Brick Lane. Interestingly, in a kind of moment of East End kind of cultural tradition, somebody s saw the, the smart bag in which this bomb was placed and stole the bomb. Or, you know, they, they stole the bomb and put it in the boot of their car, the trunk of their car. Uh, so what happened was that when um, they looked at the trunk of their car and realized they had stolen the bomb, uh, they actually rang the police and while they were ringing the police. And fortunately, uh, when the bomb went off, it was placed in a crowded street in a very smart training bag. But because somebody had stolen the bomb and put it in the trunk of their car, it exploded in the, in the boot of the car. Uh, a lot of property was damaged, but the, and a friend of mine was actually injured, but injured not nearly as badly as would have been the case if the bomb had gone off in uh, a, crowded, a crowded street. And thirdly, and most terrifically, he was going to bomb Chinatown in the West End. And on his way to Chinatown, he stopped for a drink in what he didn't realize, but in fact was uh, the, uh, the gay village just to the north of Chinatown. And was so appalled by that particular form of difference, he bombed uh, a pub in the gay village and a horrific deaths resulted, and he was eventually picked up. But those forms of intolerance have been seen on the streets that I live before we had the events of July 2005. When one of the one of the railway stations that was bombed or get or get east uh, was in the East End, um, again involved horrific killings. But the first suicide bombs uh, that have been seen uh, in London were followed two weeks later. The trial that's um, ongoing at the moment with another set of bombs uh, that didn't go off. Again, one of those was in the, the, the East End itself. So there is a kind of I don't mean this either kind of heroically or in a macabre fashion, but there is, there's been a pattern over the last 15 years of violence that has been based around the multicultural settlement of, of, of London. And that violence has been about an intolerance of, of difference. And what is striking about the people that were bombers, without going into huge detail about it, but the horror of the events of two, the summer of 2005 was when the inevitable suicide videos came out. With, and the important thing I think to remember is that largely these are British kids who are blowing themselves up. British kids speaking in northern accents, very vernacular, strong British accents, from Caribbean and Pakistani backgrounds, but also the victims themselves. The, the person on the right uh, actually lived at the end of my street to speak to her parents on the day. Uh, the days which um, she was uh, missing uh, before it became clear. I mean, horrifically, she had actually gone to work um, and been uh, delayed by the explosion of one set of the bombs. People may not know who were, but uh, one of the bombers was going to um, go on one particular tube line, and it is, it is believed that this is the case that was not working the underground line and so therefore went on a bus and uh, so three tube lines and a bus were blown up in the four suicide bombs in London in 2005 and Shannara actually was delayed going to work uh, went to uh, King's Cross couldn't get on the tubes because all the tubes had been shut down because a bomb and got on a bus and all the horrific I mean, to the horror of her, and the horror of her family was that she had actually rung her, her, her brother after the bombs, the first bombs had gone off, and said that she was going to go to the West End of London to go shopping, and was killed as a as uh, because she got on the wrong bus. Mm -hmm.
So, so the, the point I'm, try, I'm trying to make is that the forms of gross intolerance of difference have multiple routes into London and multiple routes out of London. Part of them connect to a sense of global Islam and a radicalization around Islam. But they also tie historically to different kinds of nationalism. The nationalism of Ireland in the IRA bombs, the nationalism of the far right in Britain in the British National Party connected bombs of, of, of David Copeland. And the point that I want to make is that we need to understand that these contests, these contested versions of the multicultural are happening every day. They're happening every day on the streets of East London. So that when you see street signs like this, where the old postcodes in London, this should be E1, has been carefully painted out to B1, which is Bangalore 1. Bangalore Town was initially a term of abuse used by the far right about the area around Spitalfield, but was then embraced by people locally and turned on its head, as often with form those forms of abuse, into a sense of celebration of, of Bangalore Town. And actually that part, that ward of London is now known as Spitalfield and Bangalore Town. There's an old graffiti from one of the street signs, uh, an image I took a, a, a while ago. It's also the sense that, that, that there is, when you look at the signs of the street, you see a context of street, street writing, which is partly around issues of Islam. This particular mural was on the, 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 uh, the, the cut, that area is almost a particular kind of public space where kids meet together. There is a debate that is live about football teams, about drugs, about prostitution, but also about politics of left, of right, of Iraq, not Iraq, but also about, about a certain kind of radicalization that goes on. And so you have both the mural, a particular kind of hip-hop vernacular, which I think is important to understand in all sorts of ambivalent ways, but also the, the tag, the neutral zone, was, was here. So the point I'm trying to make is that the, the, the radicalization of young people around Islam is itself contested. And so I want to just begin to, to finish with the last five minutes, about five minutes more, is that the future? We're just talking about how that feeds into the events that lead up to 2006 and come back to, to the, the, the place where I started. And the campaign that generated this party called Respect that drew together uh, Mr. Galloway's interests, the Socialist Worker Party interests, with a particular form of political Islam. I think, it, importantly, it mobilized around two things. And what was the, what's the argument that I've written some other stuff about academically, which I'm not really dwelling on today, is that both of these represent kind of forms of, of the global familiar. That there was a kind of campaign around the future of social housing in the, in the area. There is a big debate, which I haven't got time to talk about, but whereby we politically were committed to try and generate investment in what's known in Britain as social housing, which is housing rented at subsidised levels, which rep represented of the 200,000 people that live in this borough. Um, as little as 15, 16 years ago, uh, about 120, 130,000 of those people were living in that social rented housing. A lot of that was bought out under what was known as right to buy legislation, where people were allowed to buy their own flats at a discounted rate. But even, even in the late 1990s, early 2000s, uh, about 40% or more of people were still living in socially rented housing in that area. And to get investment in that housing, which had been mostly built in the period of time in the post-war era, post-45, when this area was very, very badly bombed out, and been massively underinvested in since. One of the things I was involved with politically was trying to negotiate ways in which you could generate money to invest in this stock. It also involved uh, not-for-profit organizations taking over the ownership of the stock from the local state. Some people suggested this is privatization, and some people I don't know and respect different enormously from my own political take on it, my political take on it was that when people were dying in the estate in the area I represented in the ward I represented if you were Bangladeshi uh, and you lived on one of the worst estates in, in Britain, um, your life expectation if you were a Bangladeshi man was that the average age at death was, and I'll get this wrong, but roughly right, 
was uh, 5758, but was something like 14, 15 years less life <coughs> expectation than the average age of, across the country as a whole very closely tied to appalling housing conditions. So the, the, the kind of political need to try and invest in housing stock, that right, for me was quite important. But the point was that, that, that there was quite legitimately a political campaign against that uh, right to change housing stock. But it was also a campaign that became very closely identified with the, the far left. But I think importantly, in terms of the argument I'm trying to make, it tied into a sense of the neighborhood that sense of the, of the familiar unit that appealed to that very strong appeal to the about people's local neighbourhood. But also, the second strand that defined the Respect Party was a sense of global Islam being attacked by the British Army, the American Army in Iraq, and a debate about Israel-Palestine, which I haven't even got time to, to begin to hint at. The point I want to make, though, I think, is that within that debate, the, the figure of Jewishness, as well as the figure of Christianity, plays a particular kind of narrative role. I think there is a kind of casual anti-Semitism, frankly, that, that informs part of that, of that role. Uh, because it defines the political imaginary as being a mobilization of the global Ummah against a certain kind of opposition. And the figure of Jewishness occupies a particular role in those kinds of narr those kinds of narratives. Although not, as you can see, the figure of Jewishness alone. So the caricature of um, Blair as a nun and Bush as a priest, uh, but Blair's decision to kill Muslims and plunder Muslim lands is inspired by God. What will your decision to support his party be inspired by? Make, make some particular, this was a lead, another leaf that was distributed in, in, in the, the campaign on the ground uh, last year. There's one, you probably can't see this, but there's, there's a quote in here that says, um, if you don't want Muslim blood on your hands, don't support the party of war criminals and traitors. You'll be asked on the day of judgment what you did with your vote when you had a chance to punish those who were responsible for killing countless Muslims. Don't be fooled anymore. The point I'm trying to make in kind of coming back full circle to this is that we've seen in London a kind of radicalization that is very powerful. But I think we need to understand where that radicalization emerges from. And the point that I try and argue is that it actually ties partly to certain histories in the context of East London in particular, certain histories that link international forms of Salafism through London and, and, and to Bangladesh and, and, and back again but also depend on appeals, very emotive appeals, to a certain kind of global familiar, a certain kind of global woman, and a certain kind of known neighborhood that are sentimentally extraordinarily strong, that depend upon narratives of otherness that are about a rejection of otherness, and depend partly upon a narrativization of anti-Semitism as well. But I think, what I want to try to suggest is that those forms, including those forms of intolerance, do need to be rooted, literally need to be rooted. And I think I, that's why I probably differ from um, some of the arguments that Charles has made. I, I don't see this, frankly, as, as a social movement of anti Semitism as, as such. What I do see instead is that what, what, it, what emerges is the creation of new kinds of political imaginaries that depend upon certain kinds of otherness reinforcing their stories, certain kinds of hatreds being reproduced. And those kinds of hatreds are, at times, dependent on forms of anti-Semitism, the subject I know is most at the heart of the work here. But it, I, I don't think that we can simply say that that means that anti-Semitism per se is a social, social movement. I think what you can say is that we need to kind of map out where these forms of intolerance are emerging from, what are their histories, how are they produced in terms of people's thinking, but also in terms of the relationships between different parts of the world. 
In the same way, we have seen the growth of a fairly horrific reaction to the bombs of 2005, so that there is on trial at the moment in London a member of the British National Party who has also had stockpiles of explosives uh, that were bought for him by a qualified dentist in the north of England. I mean, that they were basically caught stockpiling a bomb-making factory from the far right. So we, I don't, it is important not to be melodramatic about what is going on, but it is important to understand that that form of intolerance depends upon the creation of Islam as another that is there to be hated. It depends on a naturalization of Huntington's kind of irreconcilable difference between cultures. And so the point I'm, try I'm trying to make is these different kinds of intolerance have their roots, they have their maps. They partly depend on, if you like, screen capitalism's imaginary. But they also, I think, demand with some imperative a response which actually names the coming together of certain kinds of leftism with certain kinds of Islamicism as being, creating a particular danger at the moment but also equally demands an understanding and a combating of different kinds of intolerance. The intolerance that we see in Islamophobia, as well as the tolerance, intolerance we see in anti-Semitism, as well as in the other kinds of intolerance that we've seen too often in London in the last 20 years, and particularly over the last 12 months. I'd say. But I hope that gives you a sense of what to know. So Michael, thank you for a, a really rich uh, presentation. And then uh, I'll ask the first question. Um, so I, I agree strongly that, in a sense, that the, the, the intolerance of differences really seems to be maybe one of the core issues, um, or, the, or the core way of labeling some of the problems that we're confronting with globally in terms of identity politics and some of the issues that you mentioned. So my, my question is, in terms of globalization, you mentioned sort of liberalism versus a communitarian view of society and the debates that happen within both sort of approaches, between the left and the right. And you mentioned screen capitalism. So I was wondering, can you comment on, on the, say, the globalization as a, as a process, I'm thinking of people like Bowman, Zygmunt Bowman, and, and Castell, and David Harvey, that look at you know, issues of hybridity and sort of the flip side, or the dark side of globalization, which they comment on how you know, the marginalized groups of globalization um, are sort of stripped away of political, social, and economic power, and they resort to cultural or the, the terrain of culture to, to resist the onslaught of neoliberal globalization. And that once culture becomes a terrain of struggle, it inherently becomes you know, nostalgic and reactionary and that sort of thing. So so structurally, how, how do we fight the intolerance of difference, which, is, which I argue you know, is the social movement of the dispossessed? which is reactionary. How do, we, how do we deal with the structural inequalities that is creating this disparity? Um, and I, loosely speaking, that's sort of a progressive way of accepting diversity in cities and diversity in society. So, so structurally, how, how do we deal with this phenomenon? Um, and that, that's one part of the question. And there's a lot of you Introduce so many amazing ideas, so I'll leave it there. I'll ask the second. I mean, first of all, I don't. Part of what I'm trying to say is that I don't see cultural politics as being, uh, particularly if you talk about people like Castells and Harvey, I, I would argue, um, firstly, that I don't see cultural politics as being an effect or as a secondary phenomenon as they, as they would. Um, Secondly, that there is something that actually ties to that, that logic, that you have the big forces of globalization and capital reorganization, and then what gets determined as an afterthought or is, um, as an effect is a, a residuum of identity politics or cultural politics. And that is, 
apply that logic necessarily backward. And Cassells talks about this in what in his work, which I think is very powerful in lots of ways. But identity politics becomes almost a um, something that is is backward by its very nature. And I think that that's wrong precisely because it doesn't get to grips with some things that we all want, which are sometimes incommensurable. It comes back, I know this sounds a very trite or simplistic way to describe it, but when we think about the city, there is a way of thinking about the city of modernity, the city of the 20th century, as being profoundly liberating, precisely because it values anonymity, it values the presence of the stranger, it values the fact that people can live together in situations where their relationships to each other are not determined by their family, by their, their skin colour, by the various kinds of known relationships. They are citizens in a particular space. And that that kind of writing that values the anonymity of the city, that values the rights of the city, sits in quite a strong tension with the kinds of writing that quite often we might like as well, that, that tends to value the, the cherished and known spaces of, of, of community. So writers like Jane Jacobs talking about New York many years ago in, in Greenwich Village would talk about the, 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 the value of the spirit of community, the history of community in that particular part, part of town. But that spirit of community, which is partly about the fact that crime levels are low because everybody knows each other and looks at each other, is partly contrary to the fact that the knowing and looking and uh, nosiness of community is partly about the suppression of difference, whether it's the emergence of gay communities or <coughs> Marshall Berman, who writes a fantastic book called the Solid Nuts Into Air, talks about the problem with Jane Jacobs being that her Greenwich Village that she cherishes so much and the city of New York that she cherishes so much is the city before the black folk get there. Mm. So we have to understand that there is a tension between you know, the, the, the city as known and the city as a space of, of, of freedom. And the, the way that then emerges, in, I think in the 21st century, there is a, a different kind of version of, of this that, that is also precisely about the extent to which we manage different kinds of difference in the spaces of London or New York or Los Angeles or, or Shanghai for, for that matter, which do tie in tensions between certain kinds of global familiar. As you say, Islam is, is I think, one example, but I think we, we will see the emergence of, of, of many more over, over the years, which I think is means that culture, that cultural politics is going to be part of the determining of what happens, rather than just an effect of economic globalization is what I'm trying to say. Sorry. Sorry. I had a question about the specifics of your borough and your election. You explained um, the feeling against the Labour Party because of their politics, which isn't a particularly Semitic party, against the IRA that was violent toward them, toward the ultra-nationalists that was violent toward them, and a diminishing elderly Jewish population. What would be the roots, the specific local roots of anti-Semitism then when all their opposition really weren't Semitic, it seems to me? Yeah, I'm sorry, I may have um, given a description of slavery. right? I wasn't saying, you see, what I was saying is that anti-Semitism has been rooted through the East End, but not all of the intolerance of, of difference or the violence is attributed to anti-Semitism per se. Just to give you two examples, that the, the, the people often talk journalistically now about the white East End, mm -hmm. and it's actually a very foreshortened historical memory that can talk about it. People will probably remember the character Archie Bunker, uh, Archie Bunker was based on a character called Alf Garnet. Mm -hmm. uh, Alf Garnet lived in Wapping, and he was kind of part of a kind of caricature of White East Ender, who was intolerant and racist in the 1960s. And the White East End is quite often talked about unproblematically when it really contains these very different traditions, the, the Irish tradition, Jewish tradition, all in that part of London. So the area, 
as it happens, my family, my mum was born, uh, and my grandfather was a, a policeman in the, the Wapping area, uh, which is still Catholic, excuse me, and then it covers that the Catholic Irish bit is still there, but also they're getting old and moving on, although I'll probably say this even on crime on camera, but the, you know, the crime family that controls Wapping is still Irish. Still Irish. Um, and so there are old traces that, that, that remain. The point is the IRA bombs weren't against the Jewish community. I think they were, they were a form of nationalism. You know, I'm, I'm talking about the Bangladesh feeling yes. against um, that somehow there's a root of it. Is it if it's all going to be historical, we're in deep trouble. <laughs> no, no, well, it's, 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 that's what I'm trying to say. It's partly about a new, uh, uh, the, the, the quote that I gave, is that, that there is a new way of imagining ourselves. It doesn't just fit within a nation that is multiple, that sees ourselves being both very local, but also part of a broader global community. I think what I'm trying to say is, is that, that certain strands of anti-Semitism actually do fit within new ways of narrating oneself in the world, but they're, they're just part of a bigger, sto bigger story as, as well. And I think the, 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 bomber, the nail bomber, the nail bomber who also bombed uh, Brick Lane, is the bomb that was Nick, but was actually, yeah, he, he bombed the Caribbean community in Brixton, as well as the Bangladeshi community in Brick Lane, the Chinese community in Chinatown, and ended up in the, the gay pub. I mean, you know, that was a particular, the, the point I'm trying to make is that the forms of intolerance have been many in their origin, and many in their, their, their target. But we have to understand where that intolerance is, is, is coming from in 21st century. But, sorry. I also have a question specifically about Yero Goro. You mentioned that the uh, third, fourth generation uh, Bangladeshis have rejected the, the secular leftist uh, plot lines and have now turned to more radical, or not even radical, but more religious uh, understanding of themselves. Yes. And can you talk a little bit about what were the local grievances that led to that change? Why did they not just continue on? Um, because I assume you don't, you don't want to make the case that it's just because of global influences that they've no. turned away. No, I'm not, absolutely. Um, I think it's hard to give a single, you know, a, a single story, story because part of the second, third generation's um, politics was part of in partly events through a very successful machine, uh, an old style, almost kind of Chicago Daily style political machine that was um, I was complicit in or part of in some, in some senses that generated uh, political control and the, without that guy, I'm not going to spend a lot of time giving numbers and facts and figures and, and personalities, but basically a, a, a secular left machine that included friends of mine that used to go. You know, after 10 o'clock you'd go drinking in the pub and playing cards and gambling, you know, which I probably shouldn't have done, but that was what we did, um, was, which was largely Bangladeshi, uh, took control of the, the borough, largely, in alliance with kind of, I guess, people like myself who are kind of of the, of the left and mostly of the voluntary, sec voluntary sector as well. And were in some senses seem to, seem to deliver on, on a certain kind of agenda. So there were enormous improvements in education, enormous improvements in welfare support. At, at, the same, at the same time, I think what was the case was that many of that generation began to move on, and move out and get on. Many of the bits of the machine, I think, became rotten in particular ways. Some bits of the machine seemed to be corrupt, not the whole machine itself. Uh, there was also a sense of growing um, uh, debate about the way in which that machine was seen to deliver um, uh, nationally, as in you know, it was addressing local debates fairly effectively, but at a time when the issues around the, the war in uh, Iraq be, became increasingly significant in the, the beginning of the 21st century, but also going back before then, what had happened was that whereas, as, as I say, the Rushdie affair never played in the 1980s in the East End, what did happen quite systematically was that uh, a number of organizations started addressing the needs of young people at the very early, 
a very early stage in the 1990s. I did a piece of research in the 1990s which interviewed people where some young men in that area quite close to where the graffiti was um, who were involved in very violent youth, uh, Bangladesh, young Bangladeshi youth violence with people being hurt very badly, but also where drugs, crack cocaine rips through the community at incredible speed as it does in many parts of the world. Who, who goes and fights that? Well, the political machine, kind of grown old and occupied positions of power. Who's there on, on the street at that particular time? Young Muslim organization organizes, but also informal, one of the people I know who is a kind of flawed person I've interviewed so, several times with an academic path on, uh, was very violent, involved in some things I shouldn't even say, but some pretty horrific stuff. Finds God, finds faith, and in finding faith, he finds a certain kind of Islam and starts, in his case, he started kidnapping kids and making them go cold turkey while he was reading the Quran. And so Islam becomes a kind of radicalization of the street that ties into some fairly grim socioeconomic realities that are still going on, notwithstanding some of the good things that the Bangladeshi machine is de delivering. So the Bangladeshi machine become the establishment. Those people that see the establishment as not, as not good enough um, are increasingly attracted by a number of people who uh, are increasingly radical. At the same time, the distance from 1971 growth. So there is a generation still that is present that would are uh, mostly old men now in their 50s and 60s that will have absolutely nothing to do with Jamaat or the politics of Jamaat. Uh, even though I'm not, you know, I've got to be careful what, I, what I'm saying, but there's a debate about the extent to which the politics of Jamaat ties into the politics of July, the, the suicide, the, or does or doesn't tie into the ultra radicalization agenda. But the, but the point the point that I make is that the, the growing Islamization of some of the young people is in very much a kind of generational sense, something that some of the people who are now in the 50s or 60s see as being deeply troubling because of what happened in Bangladesh in 71. So the distance from 71 to 2007 gets played in very different ways uh, according to where you stand personally, what your life chances are in terms of whether you're a kid caught up in the street and the drugs wars or gang wars which have involved guns and knives and all sorts of politics around that sort of stuff, as well as debates around what's happening in Palestine, Israel, Iraq, uh, Iran, and so on. So, so th th there is a debate that is simultaneously about what's happening over there and what's so happening so very much here, going on at the same time. Mm -hmm. Thanks. That's a sort of, so, well, thank you. Well, there are, it, 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 it's almost impossible to have a well-mixed community that will sustain itself as well-mixed over a substantial period of time. I'm thinking of uh, some of the work that Tom Jellin did years ago, where you, you know, you, you, you take two groups and, and you basically give them very simple preferences. Which is, I just want to be in a place where I'm a simple majority. Not that I'm in a, in a neighborhood that is overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly <coughs> black, overwhelmingly Jewish, but you know, I just want there to be one more. And, and then the question is, what happens? What, what patterns emerge if you have people who just sort of have the same properties? And what happens is, is you know, you basically get segregation patterns. So while you can, you can go back and, and say, you know, the specific history gives rise to these concentrations of people in the different places and so on, it's actually so fragile that even without that, it seems to me, you'd still end up with, with sort of birds of a feather, as it were, like, like living with life. And so, so that's, that's the first part of the observation. And the second thing is I think what's really different recently, uh, as opposed to the past, is, is what I can remember the writer who, who used the term, but the screen capitalism idea, that the fact that, that information is everywhere simultaneously, that's actually new. That's something that, that, that wasn't always around. And so what happens is you now live in a world where you can kind of say, well, if I happen to be in this town, I can be in this part of town, which is my kind of place. And if I go to New York, if I go to Paris, if I go to London, if I go to Brisbane, I can always find the right part of town to go to, which is sort of the same type of place for me. And you see the same, you get the same information, you get the same, uh, you know, you kind of get, get the same input to, to how the world works. It doesn't matter where you are so so it, it just seems that in that kind of an environment, it's a lot easier 
to, to sort of uh, start people off moving in one direction or another. And, and it seems like that's one of the things that happened here. I mean, is this possible to really concentrate the information? And in this respect, Dan Bain picked on a couple of themes. Uh, you know, it really fueled, fueled the situation. Um, the information from the Middle East that you were suggesting. I, 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 guess, I guess what I'm worried about is that because if, if, if the only way to explain what's happening is you go to every city and say, well, there's all these unique circumstances there, then in a sense, in a way, it's not really an explanation. It's a, it's, it's a description of what happened in that place. And what I'm suggesting is that.